Good afternoon, everyone. I guess it's my turn. <laughs> nice to be with you. And uh, Lupe gave us these little things here to make us look stylish, so I hope you appreciate that. <laughs> now, Burmy told a couple, I like Burmy jokes. I, I, I like them a lot, and I, I wish he would give them every time he speaks. So I know a few of us groan, but when, when I think about them, it lifts me up. <laughs> and so, I heard a joke last week, and I have to share it with you because I thought it was pretty good. There's this old, retired doctor. His name's Dr. Gordon Geezer. <laughs> and he got very bored after he was retired for a few years. And he decided to reopen his medical practice, so he put a sign outside and it said, Dr. Geezer's Clinic, get your treatment for $500. If you're not cured, I'll refund you $1,000. That will bring people in, you can see. Well, another doctor uh, who had a decent practice and was concerned that the Dr. Geezer would cut into his business started watching this guy and he was convinced that this Dr. Geezer was a fraud and that he didn't really know much about medicine. So he decided he'd go visit Dr. Geezer himself and maybe claim a thousand dollars in the process. So he went in and he said, Dr. Geezer, I've lost all the taste in my mouth. Can you please help me? Oh, sure, easy. Nurse, uh, please bring me some medicine from box 22 in the back room and put three drops in this man's mouth on his tongue. And she said, okay, right away. Put the eyedropper, three drops on his tongue. Oh, oh, this is gasoline. Congratulations. You've got your taste back. That'll be $500. <laughs> Dr. Young goes away annoyed. <laughs> and after a couple of days of thinking about what he could really do to recover his money and expose Dr. Geezer, he went back and said, Dr. Geezer, I hope you can help me. I, I've lost my memory. I, I can't recall many things. Sure, I can help you. Nurse, would you please go back in the back room and get uh, that... Uh, Medicine from box 22? <laughs> he said, oh, no, you don't. That's gasoline. <laughs> Congratulations. You got your memory back. Only $500. <laughs> Dr. Young now, he's out $1,000. He's pretty upset. After several days, go, go, several days go by, he says, I know, I got him this time. So he goes in and he said, Dr. Geezer, my... My eyesight has gotten very weak. I, I fear I'm going blind. I can't see things right in front of me. And uh, he said, well, I'm sorry. I, I, I can't help you with that. I'll have to give you $1,000. So he reaches in his wallet and gives him a $10 bill. <laughs> the man says, oh, wait a minute. This isn't $1,000. This is a $10 bill. Congratulations, you've got your eyesight back. <laughs> the moral of the story is, just because you're young doesn't mean you can outsmart an old geezer. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. I, uh, oh yeah, <laughs> after, uh, after services last week, um, uh, Tammy gave the sermon message last week, and uh, and you know I should comment that uh, we're blessed here. You know, Bernie's a, a good speaker, and I always enjoy when uh, Dr. Morrison presents. He's a, a great content, good speaker, thoughtful stuff. And and, uh, and Tammy did uh, that might have been the best I've ever heard Tammy speak last week. And afterwards, uh, while we were in here, a few people came up to me and said, "I'd like you to give a sequel to that sermon." I said, oh, okay, I suppose I could do that. And then I went back inside the, the back room there so we, we could have our potluck meal and was talking with a couple of people. And, and one person said, um, maybe you could uh, explain what it means to be in Christ. I said, yeah, I could do that. And then <laughs> as I was leaving, uh, Tammy and I were getting ready to go, Pastor Bernie came up to me and said, you know, next week is a Cinco de Mayo celebration. Could you give the sermon? 
So I said, sure, sure, I can do that. And so my stream of consciousness today uh, in, in this message is combining all those three requests in one sermon. I pray it goes well. And as you know, the theme is uh, for us to celebrate today is Cinco de Mayo, and it is a celebration. But that's not the only thing being celebrated today. There is uh, three or four websites that record and promote different causes every day. In fact, one of the websites I subscribe to their, they send you an email every day and tell you today is National Hot Dog Day or today is National Potato Chip Day. Well, today there are six or seven things. Today is National Hoagie Day. I don't know if you all know what a hoagie is. It's a sandwich with assorted cheeses and meats. Today is also National Lemonade Day. So I guess we should drink some lemonade today. Today is also National Cartoonist Day. It is also National Astronaut Day. I don't know why. I didn't look it up. Today is also National Infertility Survival Day. So, so I'm happy for those who have survived. And last but not least, today is also National Chipotle Day. For those who like smoked jalapenos and, and chipotle sauce, as, as I do. In fact, I think... That's why I have a little bit of upset stomach today. Uh, I had probably too much of that yesterday. <laughs> and uh, I went to bed feeling good, and I woke up in the middle of the night. I suppose that hot sauce was burning its way through me. <laughs> so if I seem a mild bit subdued, um, it's because of that. Uh, let, me, um, let me, before I show this video clip, uh, set it up. Um, because today is truly a day of celebration. Not only those seven things that I commented on as national days of celebration, but we're going to uh, celebrate by partaking in the elements of the Lord's Supper. And that is always a cause for celebration. But uh, to set this up in the celebratory mood that I have in mind, uh, and to answer the question as the title of my sermon, Who is your biggest cheerleader? Have you seen the movie The Natural? How many have seen it, remember it? Oh my, but that few? Like six? Oh, it's a great movie. Um, Robert Redford is the star in this movie. And, uh, and I can't, I don't want to tell you the whole movie. I don't want to ruin it for you, but I'm going to spoil the ending by showing you the clip. But uh, that's okay. I think you'll enjoy the clip. And I apologize for the quality. You know, I, I did the this ripping and uh, trying to do it on my own little laptop computer and I don't have the high class software that I had when our headquarters was here <laughs> and to go on their Apple machine and make magic on that. So, uh, so I apologize for that but I want you to take notice of a couple of things when you watch this. It's the conclusion of the movie. It's the last inning of the World Series baseball game. right? And they're losing two to nothing. And it's the bottom of the ninth inning. That is the last bat for the home team. And there's two outs. And they have runners on first and second. And if Robert Redford, who comes up to bat, if he gets a base hit, well, two runs will score, but it's still tied. And uh, if he gets a home run, it's a walk-off home run, as they call it. And the team wins, and they celebrate. And uh, there's a couple other things you might take note of. I, you know, Robert Redford has played a lot of what I call the Messiah role. In many of the movies he plays, he's this savior figure. And he saves the prison reform. He saves a guy's life. He, in this case, saves the baseball team and they win the World Series. And you'll notice when he's batting, he's bleeding from a wound in his side. You'll, they make an issue out of that. They show you the blood coming out of it. And... Uh, and you'll notice and take particular notice how everyone's cheering for him. The baseball fans, little kids, old men uh, are all cheering. His teammates are all cheering. And not only are they cheering, but this uh, love interest in his life is there. And she is in the upper stairway of the ballpark, kind of looking down and out on him. And in you know, the lights, it's like she's this angelic figure. So. You, you see all these parallels and what they represent. That's what good movie making is all about. So uh, I'll leave it to uh, 
to our technical people back there, uh, Stephen and Jillian, to play the video clip next and probably be helpful to turn off all these bright lights so you can see it better. Yeah. At least that helps my eyes. <laughs> well, I don't want to be in the way. I like how at the end there they show the baseball is still ascending yeah. <laughs> into the sky. <laughs> it's going. I'm sorry that I've spoiled the movie now for those of you who uh, haven't seen it, if you are to see it. But maybe I haven't spoiled it. Maybe you want to see it now and see the intrigue and why this is such a happy ending and why everyone's celebrating. Uh, and it, it reminds me, when I watched the movie, uh, it, it was on <laughs> recently and, uh, and I was, I think it was probably the third time I saw it on TV. And I was really enjoying it because it's nostalgic for me. It, it, I played baseball a lot when I was a kid. I was in Little League, uh, growing up in Chicago in Pony League. And, and uh, my dad uh, was a pretty big cheerleader. In fact, um, it was mortifyingly embarrassing <laughs> when my dad would come to the games because he would cheer louder than anybody else. And I could hear him, he'd call me Jojo. Let's go, Jojo! And I, you know, the, but not only did I hear him, but I think, not only, and the whole field heard him, but I think on the field across the street, they heard him too. And he would do this every time, he'd cheer that loud. And that wasn't only when I was a little kid. Uh, when I was in Ambassador College, uh, playing on uh, the basketball team, so, you know, here I am, 17 to 21, for those years I played on the basketball team. <laughs> He'd come to the games, and that was even more mortifyingly embarrassing, because I, I knew everybody there in the, uh, in the gymnasium. And, uh, and we had cheerleaders, and I thought, you know, come on, Dad, let the cheerleaders do the cheering and, and, and making the noise. But my dad would yell so loud that I could hear him on the court, over the crowd, over the cheerleaders, yelling. And I uh, just say, oh. In fact, there were times when I actually felt more comfortable when he didn't come to the game. Because uh, then he, he wasn't a distraction to me. Um, but looking back now, you know, since he's died, retrospectively, it was a good distraction. And on the next slide, I asked the question, who is your biggest cheerleader? And I have some pictures of people in my life, my family, a picture of, uh, of my mom and dad when they first moved to Pasadena, California, a picture of my dad's father, and uh, he was mortifyingly embarrassing too. I, I, I understand why my dad was the way he was. My grandfather would take me by the hand and take me for walks in the neighborhood, and we'd go into every store that, that there was in the shopping center. And, you know, I'm just a little kid holding his hand, and he'd say, this is my grandson. He's the only one with my name. <laughs> because my dad was the only boy, and he had five sisters, and all those boys had different names. So I carried his surname. And, you know, and I thought, boy, my grandpa's just a bit over the top. Even as a three-year-old, I thought, Grandpa was unbelievable, and he was he was a big cheerleader, and uh, I have pictures of Tammy's dad there. He he was a cheerleader, and of course Tammy and my daughter and Tammy's mom. And these these are all people who were cheerleaders. C consider in your life who has been your biggest cheerleader, and undoubtedly for the most part it'll be family members or or dear friends. I, I you know when I was in my doctoral program at Azusa Pacific, I made some very good friends, some close friends uh, in the faculty, professors from which I, I took classes, sat at their feet, and read the books they made us read, and write the papers they made us write, and, uh, and I have dear memories of some of those. Um, my son's always been one of my biggest cheerleaders, uh, too. So you probably can, in your mind's eye, in the stillness of your memory, come up with faces and names of people who are your biggest cheerleaders. And as uh, one of my professors, uh, I had Dallas Willard as a professor for a semester at Azusa Pacific. He was uh, on loan from uh, USC to APU for, I don't know, a year or so. And uh, uh, he's dead now, but my, wow, he, he was a, an excellent professor. And uh, I'm, I'm just delighted when I think back 
of my collegiate career that I had him as a professor. But he talked about something, he called it the great omission, that when people are called to be Christians, what they're called to do is to become cheerleaders and mentors to everyone to have Jesus follow. Follow him, follow Jesus. It's kind of a paraphrase of what Jesus himself said about us being the, the salt and the light. The salt to make people thirsty for Jesus, the light to help people see where to go, who to follow, and that is Jesus. But as wonderful as my experience growing up was, and uh, even to this ripe old retirement age, and thinking of all the cheerleaders I've had in my life, when I ask myself the question, who is my biggest cheerleader on the next slide, I have to be real and say, they were not my biggest cheerleaders. As good and as great and as wonderful they were as cheerleaders in my life, they were not my biggest cheerleader. And I say to you, no matter who you think is your biggest cheerleader, cheerleader in or has been your biggest cheerleader in your life, unless you fill in the blank with the name God, your answer is wrong. God is our biggest cheerleader. And on the next slide, I want to talk about a few reasons why. First of all, and imagine at some point in your life, we all wonder why God created everything. Has anyone ever pondered that? Uh, sit, sit, maybe if you had too much hot sauce or <laughs> one too many margaritas, you sit around pondering, why did God do all this? My goodness. And we're not alone in wondering that question. King David wrote a psalm about it, the, the eighth psalm. He says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You know, because of technology and all its advances and telescopes out there in outer space, we see deeper and deeper into outer space. And it went from millions of stars to trillions of stars. In fact, they can't even number it. It's just the number with... They can't even figure out how many zeros to put on the end. That's how big the universe is. And when you think how big the universe is, and this is the only one we know for sure there's life on, wow, why did God do it all? Isn't that just, it blows my mind. Now, the first thing we need to know, and, and bear this in mind deeply, he didn't create us because he needs us. Now, God is perfect. You know what perfect means. Flawless. In need of nothing. That's what it means to have perfection. No changes need to be made. No fixes need to be made. Perfect. It's the best. So God is perfect. He doesn't need anything. So he certainly didn't need us. I like the way Luke records it when Paul was talking to the scholars in Greece. And he said, the God who made the world and everything in it is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Right? He doesn't need anything. And God certainly didn't make us because he was lonely. Right? God is eternal. I mean, you think about this term infinity, which goes in both directions without ending. Right? And God is infinite and God is eternal. He, there's never been a time when there wasn't God. So it put... A trillion, 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 trillion zeros on, on, in front, in, behind a one. And then say, why did God wait that long to create us? But it wasn't because he needed us. And it wasn't because he was lonely. Because all those many, 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 many years went by. He didn't need us. And of course he didn't need us because, well, he lives in community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A unity in community. And he didn't make us because he needed his ego fed, as if God needs someone to praise him. He, he, he's pretty secure about who he is and what he has and what he can do. Despite God needing us, though, he chose to create us anyway out of, as some uh, theologians use the term, the munificence of his love. Munificence meaning this never-ending big supply as if it's a city in itself, this huge, huge supply of love, never-ending perfect love. 
And it's an idea that it's impossible to get our heads around because God loved us even before he created us. In Jeremiah 31, 3, he says God loves us with an everlasting love, that, that never-ending, infinite, eternal love. So God, as John tells us, is love. And it's an amazing thing that he created us. I mean, if that's not cheerleading... I don't know what is. Second, you know, I remember seeing my son and my daughter born. And uh, for those of you who have experienced the miracle of watching your child be born, it, it forever leaves a mark on you, doesn't it? You, you, no matter how old your kid gets, you look at them and it's like in that one movie where Steve Martin looks at his grown daughter and he sees this little girl sitting in the high chair. That, that baby is forever yours. And I believe that when God looks at us, there's something similar there. Some dynamic that's similar there that we can relate to. But here's another item to consider. Next slide. He sustains us. As the uh, author of Hebrews wrote in chapter 3, he upholds all things by the word of his power. Uh, as uh, Paul in Colossians said, in him... All things are held together. Uh, Paul, I referred to the scholars there in the Areopagus, he said, uh, he gives mankind life and breath and everything. God sustains us. And the remarkable thought in my mind about that, that he sustains us in this whole universe, is, you know, in spite of how stupid humanity is, I mean, all I have to do is watch politics for the news cycle. Good grief. Uh, and the evil that takes place on a daily basis. Yet God puts up with all that nonsense and sustains the universe. Uh, that, that keeps me wondering why from time to time. And there's another consideration on the next slide. He didn't just create us and doesn't just sustain us. He redeems us. That's, that's his plan from the beginning is... Uh, uh, Thomas Torrance and uh, J.B. Torrance, great theologian, said, you know, it's not like God created Adam and Eve and didn't anticipate they're going to do something stupid. <laughs> and goes, oh, no, now what do we do? Oh, no, plan B. <laughs> no. God knows the beginning from the end. He knew from the beginning that humanity would be stupid and sin and do evil. So his plan from the beginning was to redeem us. And if that isn't enough, on the next slide, he wants a relationship with, with us and to give us a new identity in Christ. So playing an important part in God's plan gives us a new identity, and he calls us to that. It's the ministry of reconcil reconciliation, as Paul calls it. To put it in modern language of TV commercials, God calls us to reach out and touch someone. God calls us to tell a friend. God calls us to be cheerleaders for him. And that's because he is our biggest cheerleader. And as I say on the next slide, he has a plan for us. And in the Bible, it's called eternal life, where mortality will put on immortality. And, well, I'm looking forward to that. But exactly what does it mean now to be in Christ? When we become Christians, we become aware of this concept that we live in and through Jesus. And I want to give you three points. I guess I could have made seven, or I could have made just one or two, but three seems very Trinitarian. So I have three points for you on what that means to live in and through Jesus. The most common scripture, thank you, the most common description of those who follow Christ that we find in scripture is that they're in Christ. This expression, in Christ, or in the Lord, or in Him, occurs 216 times in Paul's letters and epistles, and um, I hope I counted it correctly. I have Logos software, and you can do a search and type in all those phrases, and if I add it correctly, 216 times in Paul's letters, and another 26 times in John's letters. So this phrase, in him, in Christ, in the Lord, 
uh, is indispensable in the New Testament. So to be in Christ, it doesn't mean to be inside Christ like you have tools in a toolbox or clothes in a closet. But it means to be organically united to Christ, just like a limb is attached to your body, or as the other organic analogies we see in the Gospels, a, a vine, a, you know, a branch connected to the vine. So he gives us these kinds of analogies to understand better what it means to be in Christ. But it's this personal relationship with Jesus that is a distinctive mark of his followers, and it gives us a metaphor to understand that we're connected to him, we're united to him. And I think it's well explained by what Paul wrote in Galatians 3, verses 26 to 28. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So in other words, to be in Christ means you have this brotherly or sisterly unity with Jesus that gives you greater identity. When I say greater identity, what do I mean? Um, well, you have, without Christ, a temporary identity because you'll become dust once you die. Right? You're mortal. You're temporary. Um, you have certain parents. You have certain DNA. You, you have certain identifiers. But when I say in Christ gives you a greater identity, I mean the unity we have with God. I mean you have eternal life now given to you. Uh, and you have become the temple of the living God. He chooses to live in us. Talk about unity. Talk about a greater identity. And... There are different phrases that the Christian community uses for this. One theologian coined a term that I really like and never let go of. He calls it fundavangicostal talk. Fundavangicostal talk is like a dialect that Christians speak. and They don't all speak the same dialect, sadly. But when you hear phrases like covered by his blood or have a relationship with Jesus or put on Christ or clothed with Christ, these are all biblical phrases that are used to mean this same thing, this greater identity that we have, this life, this new life, this resurrected life we have in Christ. A second reason in the next uh, slide is that there's a radical transformation and you participate in a new life in Christ. So it means to be radically transformed. As Paul once put it, if anyone is in, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He speaks of having died to our lives and sharing now in his life. Uh, I like the way the author C.S. Lewis describes it in one of his books. It's just a brief paragraph. Let me share it with you. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting rid of the drains, right, and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing, and so you are not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house than the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage. No, no. He is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. That's the radical transformation that the New Testament speaks of. And last, on the next slide, you desire to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Because we're in Christ, we find personal fulfillment to enjoy brotherly unity, to experience that radical transformation. And from time to time, I think we all experience this in our lives, Apostle Paul writes about it, that we have a struggle that we feel. It's the flesh versus the spirit. And at times that struggle can discourage us, so much so that we even doubt our own conversion. But remember this, the very fact that you're worried about it and doubting it is an indicator that you're in the right place. It's an indicator that you have concern about the Holy Spirit working in you. So, 
Paul writes a lot about it in uh, his letter to the Galatians, where he contrasts the works of the flesh with the uh, fruit of the Spirit. And that's where we go to examine ourselves and, let's say, uh, take inventory on this house that Jesus is building with us. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you, as he wrote to the Romans. And as he wrote to the Philippians, God works in us through the spirit to will and to work for his good pleasure. So now it's time to conclude. And I want to conclude with, on the next slide, some misperceptions of God. Back in uh, 2006, some sociologists from Baylor University did a study and they released the results about America's different views of God. And it included a Gallup survey which in identified four distinct views of God. And I have three of them on the screen here. As you can see, 31% of people's perceptions of God is the angry sheriff. Uh, he's just waiting to shoot you down or waiting to write you a ticket. <laughs> right? uh, he's angry. That's just the state they see him living in. Another 24% see God as distant, as if, well, he created everything like he wind up a clock and he went off and took a nap. Uh, he's distant. He, he, in fact, you hear this theme in some of... Uh, the, the songs, uh, some of the movie, Bette Midler had a song, From a Distance. And uh, I think those kinds of things in our culture only further reinforce the misperception of God. And then 16% see God as this critical judge. He can't wait to throw you into the eternal flames. Now sadly, only 23% have the correct perception of God and see him as benevolent, as someone who's forgiving, someone who is accepting of people's of repentance, someone who's compassionate, and as the Old Testament says, is gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. You know, there's when I was in uh, at APU in my program, uh, I heard a funny joke, like, what's the difference between a fundamentalist and an evangelical? And the answer is, the evangelicals understand what they're reading. <laughs> it's the fundamentalists who look at the Bible and look at all the warnings, look at all the bad things that have happened, and then transfer that to God. And ignore the parts of the Bible that explain that God is slow to anger, that he's compassionate, that he's gracious, that he abounds in love. On the next slide is my concluding scripture. And it's a concept that Zephaniah gives. I don't know how much you know about Zephaniah, but Zephaniah was a 7th century prophet. Uh, he came from a royal family. He was a great-grandson of King Hezekiah. Uh, and he lived at the same time as Jeremiah. And he uh, prophesied to the kingdom of Judah during the reign of Josiah. Uh, Josiah was a reformer king. Uh, Josiah was making changes because they'd fallen into so much paganism. And uh, that's what a lot of God's warnings and, and his proscriptions of punishment are about. Don't do that stuff, because bad things are going to happen if you do that stuff. Uh, they have their own natural consequence, and none of them play out well. If we uh, were to look at uh, the prophets and how they delivered their messages by preaching, right? Not only just what they wrote down, but looking at Zephaniah, he must have been a terribly unpopular preacher. Because 75% of his book deals with judgment, destruction, the end of the world. And the listeners knew it. And it, it, you wouldn't, if he was speaking today, you might not want to come. But imagine when you read the book and understand where it's going. Because by you, when you come to chapter 3, Zephaniah is giving people hope and explaining what God is really like. And after he finishes what are called the six discourses of doom, his 
listeners are eager and anxious on what he's going to say next if he gives them a little word of encouragement and a little joy to look forward to. And he does. And he explains in chapter 3 that they have cause to sing because God has taken away your punishment and is turning back your enemy and your sins are forgiven and your enemies will no longer dominate you. Wow, that, that's starting to sound like good news. And I love verse 17. And that's the verse I want to conclude with as you can see it here. Uh, he's... Uh, In my notes, I forgot to write down the verse. How sad. It's on the screen, yes. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you, in his love. He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Now, here's something interesting. This phrase in the Hebrew, he will rejoice over you with singing, can also be translated literally as he rejoices over you with a shout of joy. In fact, some translations give both. He will rejoice over you with singing and will shout with joy. Uh, he's, it's as if he is singing or serenading us with encouragement. Uh, he's the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. The Hebrew word that's normally used to express God's love is uh, unfailing faithfulness and fidelity is the Hebrew word chesed. And it means a covenant loyalty, a loving loyalty. It's often translated as uh, loving kindness. But here there's a different word used. It's ahaba. And it means a passionate love. It's the same kind of love that's used to express Jacob's love for Rachel a passionate love, uh, uh, Michael's love for David, a passionate love. Uh, this is the kind of love for which God is singing over you and over me. Ahaba, the passionate love. And the shouts of joy are equated with cheering for us. So it's either a song serenading us of his encouragement or singing or shouting for joy, just like the baseball player Roy Hobbs had in the field when they were all shouting for him to hit a home run. He is so delighted as having you and me as his sons and daughters that he sings over us and shouts of joy over us. Just like a mother sings to her baby to comfort her baby to peace and sleep and comfort, just like a cheerleader shouts with encouragement to the players. That's the picture Zephaniah gives us of God in his relationship with us. He sings about us. And that's why when we sing, we should sing with even more gusto than we normally do. And as we now are going to partake of the elements of the Lord's Supper, remember when you eat that bread and drink that fruit of the vine, you're joining with Jesus and celebrating what he did for us. You're joining in the song that's being sung.